Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Mysteries Unknown. I got a really special podcast for you guys tonight. I've got Daniel with me, and if that name sounds familiar, it's because Daniel's been on the podcast before, but this time he wants to talk about an experience with Bigfoot that he had with his dad and family while he was out camping in the state of Washington. Now, this experience gets really scary. You want to make sure to stay for the full podcast because you don't want to miss this story. But before we jump into that, I want to take a second to let you guys know that I appreciate each and every one of you. I appreciate your support. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Thanks for subscribing. And thanks for sharing your stories with me. If you have a story you want to send me, you can send it to me by email at video at jscreativear.com. Daniel, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Josh. Thanks for having me back, man. I really appreciate it. Man, I love having you on the show. You always have some interesting facts. And every time I hear your story, it's always facts that I maybe didn't hear the first time. And I know our audience is going to be excited about these encounters. So why don't you just take us back uh, to your childhood and uh, tell us about your uh, your encounter. Sure. So, I mean, people may ask themselves, you know, like, you know, yeah, this guy's experienced this, or he's seen that, or, you know, y- y'all have to understand, you know, where I grew up. You know, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, you know, Washington State. Uh, I'm a I'm a Gen Xer. Uh, I'm a latchkey kid. Uh, my weekends were on my bike, riding to the ends of the earth. You know, I mean, dark time was time, like I said before, it was time for us to come in and not necessarily even come in for the night just to check up, say, hey, uh, we're out here playing flashlight tag, we're playing manhunt, or we're doing something, you know. So, you know, growing up, my parents divorced when I was really, really young, right? And so I lived primarily with my dad. And my dad grew up, uh, uh, well, for five years, he lived in Oregon. That's where he was born. And then when he was five, his family, they all moved up to Alaska. So my dad was raised in Alaska. And a big thing that my dad did with his family, his dad and his brother, um, they hunted, hunted and fished. And that's what my dad and I did. We did a lot of hunting and fishing, more fishing than hunting. Um, and my dad really introduced me to hunting when I was probably around seven well, this first year, my dad brought me uh, out to this deer stand that he had put up in this tree. And it was a homemade deer stand. It wasn't anything big, no frills. Um, just a, a basic ladder going up to a little platform uh, that had a nice little bench seat on it and enough for two people. And we got up there well before dusk. And so we're up in the deer stand and it just starts getting light. And... You know, the whole time my, I'm like this, I'm just like, I'm looking around and I'm, I'm hearing all these sounds and all these, you know, these smells and everything. And I'm like, I'm just super excited. You know, I want to see a deer. I'm like, oh, you know, what are we going to see? And, and, um, my dad, he starts, you know, kind of messing with like this little pack that he had. And he's like, oh, I forgot something. I can't remember what he said he forgot, but I mean, it was important enough for him that he needed it. And he says, okay, I'm going to go. We're not that far from camp. You stay in the deer stand, and I'll be back. Now, I'm not far away from the from the camp. It was about like an hour away. Now, I'm not going to hunt, okay? Uh, I'm just going to I felt perfectly safe. Uh, my dad put me up here. My dad's like, hey, you're, you're safe. You're good to go. So I'm sitting there. I'm waiting, and I'm kind of watching. I'm watching. I'm watching, and I start nodding off. And I feel like this tug on my boot. And I kind of look down and I see that my my boot string is untied. And I'm like, well, maybe my boot got stuck on the platform or whatever. So I bring my boot up and I tie my boot again, you know, and I tie it tight. And again, I got my foot kind of stretched out a little bit. And, you know, again, I start nodding off again. And then I feel that tug again. And I move my foot up and I look down and my boot, my boot is untied again. Excuse me. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? So I go and I tie my boot again. And I'm watching and I'm watching and I'm watching. Well, I hear something off to the the right hand side of me. So I'm paying attention over the right. I'm kind of looking over here. And then I feel the tug again. And I look down, my boot strings untied again. I go, Dad, stop. I'm thinking it's my dad. He he's he's testing me, you know. You know, and my it's some kind of hunter's test, I don't know. You know? And so I'm like, Dad, stop, you know. So I go and I'm looking around. Now I'm not 
getting out of the out of the stand. I'm just kind of peeking around the sides and I don't see anything. Okay. And so I'm like, so I go and I tie my boot, my boot string up again. My and and about that time I see my dad walking up, walking up the path up towards where the deer stand was. And I go, Dad, very funny. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I go, you untied my boot. And he's like, what? What do you mean? I, I didn't untie your boot. I go, Dad, you untied my boot like three times, four times. And he's like, son, he goes, I did not untie your... And, and we're having this conversation, okay? He's down on the ground. He's I'm probably maybe 10 feet up from him, 10 feet up off the ground. And I'm looking down at my dad. I'm like, Dad, you untied my boot. He's like, son... I did not untie your boot. He's like, get out of the deer stand. I'm like, okay. So we come down and he's like, he's like, what are you talking about? I said, dad, I had my foot right here by the front of the deer, where I, off to the side, like near the front. And I started nodding off and I felt a tug at my boot and I saw my boot string was, was untied. And he's like, he's like, you're just imagining. I go, dad, I'm not imagining it. It happened like three or four times. Again, I'm seven years old I'm, or seven or eight years old. I'm getting mad and I'm also getting hurt because I think my dad thinks I'm telling him stories and it really happened. I remember tying my boots and he's like, well, well, what do you think it is? I go, dad, I don't know. I said, maybe it's uncle Daryl messing with us. Okay. And, uh, he's like, you think so? I go, yeah, probably. He's probably, he's probably, uh, uh, messing with us. And so he's like, okay, well, stay here. He goes, I'm going to walk up behind the stand. So my dad says, just stay here. So he goes up behind the deer stand and it kind of goes up, up like a little like hill, not too steep, just a gradual incline. And then there's like a wood line. He goes up and he starts walking and he stops and he kind of looks on the ground. He's kind of, I don't know. He, he sees something. He's kind of looking at it and I'm watching the whole thing. I'm like, oh, what's going on? So then he gets up maybe 25, 30 feet from the tree line where this forest was. And the forest was pretty thick behind us. And he stops, he starts looking, and he brings his rifle up like this. And he goes, ch -ch like this. He, he, he racks one in. And he just takes a strap and kind of pulls a strap in and cinches it in. And I'm like, oh, okay, what? <laughs> and he starts backing up. But he's keeping his his eye. Now I'm thinking he sees a bear, or maybe a mountain lion, or something like that. Because we're in, we're in, I want to see where the Aberdeen area outside of Aberdeen, not like not like a couple of miles. We're talking miles outside of Aberdeen, and because uh, that's where my uncle lived at the time. And uh, he goes head back down to camp, and he's following me, and he's like Tony. Well, my middle name, Anthony. So he called me Tony. He's like, Tony, go. He goes, go, just go. He goes, I got you. Just, just I'll be right behind you. Just go. And I kind of would run forward a little bit. And I'd stop and I'd see my dad move him backward. And now he's got the rifle like this and he's scanning left to right and then back right to left the whole time. Like he's covering his whole fill of fire. And I can just imagine this is what my dad did in Vietnam. Okay, my dad, when my dad was out on patrol when he was in Vietnam, you know, he was the 101st Airborne, Ashaw Valley, that type of stuff. You know, he was very observant. And, uh, you know, something just told me something wasn't right. So I picked up my pace. And I think we made it back to camp in about 35 minutes. And, uh, yeah, my dad my dad came back down there and my uncle was down there. And he's like, were you, were you? bleepity blue you effing with us up there at that stand he's like he's like no i just he goes i just got back to camp um he goes it's getting a little warm out here i don't think i don't think we're gonna have anything up and moving if it's too warm and uh he's like why he goes well something happened up there and he goes yeah we need we need to pack up and we need to head on out of here wow did, did your dad ever say what he saw because something he had to something happened to make him change his whole you know demeanor because that's like for him to back out like that especially with the training that he had you know there was a threat there obviously like I, it makes me wonder what he saw i don't think he saw anything i mean now did he see a print did he see a track i don't know i i really don't i can't to this day i still i mean i, I wish he was still around i'd ask him hey dad you know what do you see on the you know but i just think he had this this sense about him like something was 
Something just was not right with the whole situation. Again, I'm not saying that it that it was a Sasquatch. I'm not saying that it was a bear. I'm not saying it was a mountain lion, a, a cougar, whatever you want to call. It. I don't. I don't know. But I'm telling you, my boot was untied. My left boot was untied like three times, and I thought it was my dad or my uncle messing with me. You know. And that's, I mean, and, and again, for my dad to go from, oh, you know, you're just imagine it to get back to camp right now. I'm, I'm right behind you. You know, that, that was, you know, kind of a concern. That's a really big concern because like that, you know, obviously, you know, he wasn't messing with you. Your uncle wasn't messing with you. Like what other animal in the wood do you, woods do you know that could do something like that? Right. Like, especially in the area that you're at, like that, that whole area is known for that. A monkey. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess so, man. That's really, that's really crazy. I know we were talking and you kind of have another kind of a, a story that happened later on. And why don't you go ahead and, and talk about that? So this happened literally in the same camp, but this happened like a year or so later, like year, maybe two years later. Um, So in order for you to get to this camp, okay, to the, and my dad called it, my uncle called it, they called it the hunting camp. You would have to drive a couple of miles or a couple of hours outside of Aberdeen. And then you'd have to park your vehicles in this one area. And then you would have to hike in like another hour, hour and a half into the woods. Um, and we would set up like a, like the biggest thing is a GP medium tent. Okay. And it had like a wood burning stove in the center of it, like a military tent. And you could put, you know, eight to 10 people in there or whatever comfortably. Uh, everybody have enough room and everything. And so the flaps, you know, the, the sides would roll up. The flaps on the sides would, would open up and stuff like that. So you could have it completely open or completely enclosed. And so we would take uh, these sleds that they had, toboggans or whatever, and we'd carry, pull those through. Now, this camping trip that we went to was me, my dad, my little brother. It was my uncle, uh, a friend of his, and we called the Frenchman, um, and then two of his neighbors, and then both of their sons. So there were four kids and like six six adults. So there were like 10 of us there. So, you know, we had our little backpacks on, and the guys, the, the adults, they carried a majority of the stuff in. They either put it on their rucks or they pulled it, you know, on sleds. So all the adults had sleds and it had our food. It had our, you know, supplies we needed. It had our tents and all type of stuff. So we hike in about an hour and we come into the, the, this clearing. Now, again, this was a hunting camp. So this area had already been cleaned out. It cleared out. It was an easy spot for us to set the tent up, set all of our stuff how we wanted. It was right next to a pretty cool looking stream. Um, it wasn't a really fast moving stream. Um, the area directly in front of where our camp was it was maybe uh, 25 yards from the tent to the edge of the of the stream, and then it was kind of like a pebbly, kind of sandy beach that went along the way. And I'll tell you right now, day one, day two, and day three, we were supposed to be out there for four days, but we only stayed out for three days. Um, each morning, we saw bear track out by out by the stream, big big bear. Um, I don't know if it was black bear or brown bear, but a bear nonetheless. So the whole first night, first day, actually, an end night, uneventful. You know, just getting set up, you know, everything. Second day we go out, and again, we're not hunting. We're out there, honestly, we're just out there camping and fishing. That's how pretty much what we're doing. We only have guns out there for safety because of what? Bears and whatever else. And my uncle, you know, the next day, he's like, hey, who wants to do some shooting? So we're like, oh, yeah, we do, we do. So he pulls out a little tent, a Ruger 1022, and all the kids are out there shooting it, you know, we're having fun. Well, off in the distance, we hear like this howl, like this, like a real, and I'm thinking, whoa, that's a bear. And, but it was way, way, way off the distance. And, uh. I looked at my dad and I go, dad, that was a bear, wasn't it? He's like, yeah, I think it was a bear. And uh, so we didn't think anything of it. We're, we're still shooting, you know, a little 22 is just cracking. Bang, 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 bang. And uh, we get done, do some more fishing, go in, we eat. And it's kind of getting a little dark, but my dad, and my uncle want to take us on more of a little hike. So we hike up around a different part of the, the camp area. 
It's like, okay, over here you have this. And they're just, you know, again, they're they're trying to immerse us into the whole environment, the whole experience. You know, he doesn't want us to be bored. They want us to learn. They want us to have fun. They want us to enjoy ourselves. And that's what we're doing. We're having a great time. Well, that night, we're laying in bed in my, in my uh, sleeping bag. And I hear something outside of our tent. Now, remember, we had seen bear tracks the first day out by the river okay we had seen him the second day so I'm thinking it's a bear okay and I look over and my dad's awake and my uncle's awake everybody else is asleep and I'm like I'm like dad is that a bear and he's like I, he goes I think it is he goes just be quiet it's just gonna rummage around now we had everything already tied up in trees you know so there was nothing on the ground for the bear to get into the only thing he was going to get into was the tent. And if he had gotten the tent, he would have been sorry because everybody had a gun in there that, you know, and they weren't 22s. They were a lot bigger caliber rifles and, and handguns. Uh, this is where I shot my very first um, uh, Ruger Super Blackhawk 44 Magnum. My uncle thought it would be a good good time for a, a nine year old to, uh, <laughs> to, to shoot a hand cannon and uh get some experience so yeah <laughs> so you know that happened that happened that day as well that, that second day so we didn't uh you know we woke up the next morning and we saw a bunch of tracks but they weren't really clear you know what they were okay so again the next day more fishing more exploring um we actually broke up into two groups and we went deeper off into the woods just to check things out. We'd passed the deer stand that my dad and I in where I had my boot untied. Um, as we're all heading back, it's getting dusk and stuff. We hear that yell again, that, that, that howl. Um, but it wasn't so far away this time. It was a lot closer. And so my dad's like, Hey, we need to pick up the pace. So we get back into camp and it's just starting to get dark. Already got the big campfire going and stuff. And uh, we're uh, getting ready to cook dinner and stuff. Eat dinner, no problem. Take all the, the trash, throw it in the fire, let that burn. Any utensils we had, we put in a bag and we get, we hoisted everything up in a tree. A few hours later, we're all in bed. Fire's really a little dim, you know, you, you can still kind of see the faint glow a little bit coming from underneath one of the flaps. Nothing big. And we hear these noises again, but now it's like a grunt, like grunting. Um, I, Again, if I, I'm going to try to make an example, like, ugh, 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 you know, something like that. And I look at my dad, and this time, my dad, my uncle, the Frenchman, and then both the other adults, they're like sitting up. They're like wide awake. My brother's still asleep. The other two boys are sound. sound and I'm like, like, what? My dad just immediately puts his hand over my mouth and whispers in my ear, don't say a word. And I go, bear. Like, I mouth bear to him. And he's like, no. And I'm like, what, what do you mean, no? You know? And... All of a sudden, we hear the stuff that our food was in. We hear that hit the ground. Like, it just, boom. And I look at my dad. My dad's like, no good. I look over my uncle. Now, my uncle is sitting in the middle. Now, we didn't have a wood-burning stove in the middle, but he's sitting in the middle, and he has a rifle, like a high-power rifle, and he's pointing it right towards that front flap. The Frenchman is right behind him with his rifle pointing at the back flap. And I'm like, I'm freaking out. I'm doing everything. I, I'm crying. I, I know I'm just bawling. I'm trying to keep it together. I've got my hand over my mouth so I don't make any noise. And then I hear something. Because this is a canvas. This is a canvas tent. I hear something with fingernails go right down the side of the tent just slowly goes down one side of the tent and then goes down the other side of the tent and i'm ready to lose my mind my dad's got his gun 
and he's pointing. He's following just as 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 it's walking. I know he's got a beat on. He's following it. And I'm I, honestly, if something would have tried to come in into one of those flaps, it would have been Fourth of July because it would just been nonstop people just going crazy, unloading whatever they had. So I did not fall asleep for the rest of the night, and that's the only thing we heard. We heard noises outside. We heard the footsteps. Anybody who's been out in the woods for any extended period of time, you know when you hear something on two feet walking around. The cadence of the walk, the pace, whatever, it is it is undeniable. We heard our food stuff drop, and then we heard whatever was down one side and then back up the other side. Next thing I know, I'm hearing birds chirping and stuff. The three other boys, they're sound asleep. My dad, the other guys, and me, we're all wide awake. We are wide awake. I don't blame you. I'd be a, I'd be the same way, man. That's a really scary uh, encounter because, man, if the thing wanted you, I mean, even with all that firepower, I mean, it could have took some of you guys out. Like, that's crazy. How, how high up the tree was the food stored? About 10 and a half, maybe 12 feet tall, between 10, 10 and 12 feet up in the tree. Now, here's the, here's the thing, because so when we got up, when we got out, now I was not the first, I did not want to leave that tent. My uncle and the Frenchman were the first, and they, they were also Vietnam vets as well. You know, and I'm telling you right now, anybody who knows a Vietnam vet, now again, this was back, I want to say this was like late 70s. So the Vietnam War was not that old. And these guys had just come home, so you don't think for one second they're ready for action? And they were cool as cucumbers. They were acting like, no big deal. Like, they were ready to go. And so we, when they when they went out, I hear my uncle, Dean, will you take a look at this? Well, I couldn't get out of the freaking tent fast enough because I wanted to see what my dad was going to go see. Something had untied the rope that was holding our food stores up in the tree the bag that was in our that our food stores was in completely opened everything that was not in a can was gone everything we looked around i'm telling you i saw footprints probably i don't know if i can get all this maybe like this big like my at, when my brother passed away, he wore a size 16 shoe. Okay. These were bigger than that. These were, and they were all over. They were even down by the, by the stream. You could see where they walked into the stream. They walked out of the stream. They were all around the campfire, all around. They had must've gone around our tent more than one time. And I think whatever, whatever raked its nails up and down the thing, it was playing with us. That's a scary story because that, I mean, I'm telling you, man, to be that close to something that big. Well, it's not over. It's not over. So that morning, remember, this is day four. We were supposed to, we were supposed to stay out four nights. Okay. This is day four, not night four. This is day four. My uncle's like, we got to go. So we start, as we're packing everything up, like we're, everybody's up now we're packing everything we possibly can everything is not being put to put back together as neat as it was we're rushing to get everything together any clothes we had just stuffed into whoever's backpack we could put on it kids were putting on backpacks adults were just wrapping stuff up in whatever they could started putting them on the sleds and we heard a scream and the scream came from probably maybe 15 or 20 yards away from us like, and it was, it was, I mean, I'm still getting goosebumps saying, because it feels like it just rushed right through, right through the trees. Like you felt that energy. And then we heard another scream on the other side of us, probably another 25 or 30, 30 uh, meters uh, away from us as well. And it just, just super, super loud. And I look at my dad and my dad's like, we got to go. So now here, remember, it's like an hour and a half hike into the woods. We're moving. And, and this is how it was. My dad and my uncle were in the rear. The Frenchman and the two dads 
were in the front and the kids were in the middle and they they everybody was pulling what they could next thing i knew one of one of the neighbors his son was on top of one of the uh uh one of the sleds my little brother was on the sled so adults were now pulling kids with gear on sleds and we were moving through the i mean we could not be slowed down i mean we were going as fast as we could and i'll I'll, i remember hearing my dad say i've got one on the left my uncle says i've got one on the right and now they're both at the ready they're i mean the i'm oh man i'm I'm getting emotional because this, I mean. You're good, man. Take your time, man. It's all good. Man, my dad and my uncle, they were, I mean, they were, and it was, oh, the tone of their voice, it went from, hey, everything's cool, to we got one on the left. I got one on the right, and they're watching, and they're moving as fast as they can. They stop, they bring their rifles to bear, and they sight it, and they track it, and then they go in, and they say, move, 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 and they, we're keep going, we're keep going. Now, we're ahead, we're way ahead of my dad now. We're coming up to where the road comes up like this, comes up a bank up to the road, and we come up when you see our trucks, and there's three trucks. Everybody just starts throwing everything they could in the back of the first truck that they see, right? We go running. All of a sudden, I hear my dad, move, 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 start the truck, start the trucks. Well, the Frenchmen and the uh, the two neighbors, they're all, they're not even in the right trucks. They just, they, they had the keys. The keys were still in the truck, you know, the whole visor thing. We're out there so far, no one's going to steal your truck. They pull down the visors, each one jumps in a thing, and I jump in the back of the of the very first truck we come to, which was my dad's truck. My little brother climbs into the cab of that truck. The Frenchman's in the fr- in the very first truck with with uh, uh, one of the neighbor's sons, and then the na- second neighbor's in the second truck with his son. My dad comes running up, and all I see is is this sh- uh, sled that he was pulling f- come flying through the air. It lands in the back of the truck. And my dad runs by the truck I'm in, which is terrifying because I want my dad with me. And he jumps in the back of the truck that's in the middle. My uncle Daryl, he throws his his sled in the back of the truck that I'm in. Almost hits me because I'm laying in the bed of the truck. And he jumps in the bed of the truck with me. And all of a sudden, we hear everybody yell, go, go, go. My uncle just opens up, boom, boom. Boom, boom, and he's unloading. All of a sudden, my dad starts shooting out the side. He goes, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Not it's coming, they're coming. And that's when I look up like this to look, and I see this branch get thrown between the two, the truck that's in front of, of my dad's truck and my truck. If that thing that thing could have gone through this path, this driver's side window or windshield or something, but this branch just goes flying, and it wasn't like a a branch like this big around. It was a branch like this big around and probably eight to ten feet long, and it just came whizzing right through the right through the thing. And all my uncle would do was just boom, 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 just like an old western, just ham- just using that 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 lever action like he was the, the rifleman and my dad just boom racking another one boom racking another one and we took off down never again never ever have i ever gone that deep in the woods again ever and nor will i ever yeah that was my next question because that is a that is a hundred percent life altering changing experience like there is no way around that and and for you know for your dad and them being in combat coming back from the war for them to to act the way they did first of all it's a good thing that you had them with you because they knew how to handle things but for them to be scared you know and to be chased out of the woods by something like that man how how did that affect your life obviously like you said you can go back in the woods that deep again how did that affect you from that point on i never go in the woods without at least two firearms on me if i know i'm going camping and I'm going not as deep as we did that time, but a little ways in, I I have a shotgun with me and I have a high caliber handgun with me at all times. When I go on my day walks, like uh, we have a big wood wood area over by me, 
I still carry a firearm with me wherever I go. Um, I will not, um, I will not go hiking, um, off the beaten path. Um, if I know I'm going to encounter other people there, I feel a lot safer. Um, if I know I'm going to, well, it's not if I know I'm not going to a remote area to camp or, or to go hiking. Uh, I've always dreamed about walking the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail. It's not happening. That will not happen. I don't blame you. I don't think I would want to either after, especially after experiencing the things that you have and the experiences you've had uh, with Bigfoot. I know a lot of people have this mentality that it's, you know, Harry the Henderson, that it's just some friendly creature out in the woods. And, and I kind of have the tendency to believe that they're not, they're not good. They don't have good intentions. Um, but what do you think? I mean, what do you, obviously, what do you think Bigfoot you know what their intentions are and what they were that night do you think that the reason that you made it out okay is because you guys had all the all the weapons there because i think they know they know what a weapon is but you know because they heard you guys shooting them well one i think that's that's what brought them around is i think that's what brought them around you know they heard all these gunshots They're like hmm okay Here, here's the thing you know i i heard your 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 last podcast um I, I think I've been blessed to have the experiences I've had and have the, the the full sighting that I have. And I'll talk about that sighting in a second. Um, that doesn't make me an expert. That doesn't make me uh, uh, a SME, subject matter expert. It, it, it really, it, it doesn't. I'm not a Bigfoot researcher. I'm not a cryptid researcher. Uh, I'm not. I'm telling you what I saw. I'm telling you what I experienced. Um, people have had different experiences. People have seen different. Um, I know that down south they're called boogers or wood boogers. And they tend to be, especially in your neck of the woods, they tend to be very, very aggressive. Like they're just a-holes. They have no other reason but to be a jerk. Then you have the ones uh, in Texas, Oklahoma, that kind of want us tend to, to hang out to themselves. People, I've, I've heard stories of people feeding them and trying to talk with them and have cute, uh, relationships with them. Whether it be, you know, hey, come and I'm having a barbecue, bring your kids over and you can play on our playground in the backyard, swim in our pool or, or, or whatever, uh, you know. People do gifting, they gift rocks and stuff like that. And again, I, I mentioned my visual. And again, this whole area, it's not far from from where I had my my experiences and my sighting. Now it, it maybe a, a few hundred miles, maybe if that. You know, this happened near Aberdeen and where I saw my sighting was in Graham, Washington. And that was, you know, we were coming home from Tacoma, Washington. And uh, we were visiting my aunt. And this dirt road that we lived off of was you know it was like five and a half miles long and I'm, I'm not sure why the road was built uh, i i'm sure at one time maybe a timber company was going to go back through there and maybe tim you know lumber you know you know cut everything down or whatever and, and sadly now you know i've google mapped the area and it's completely gone there's no remnants of the woods or forest at all i mean there's shopping malls there or shop like shopping centers there's houses housing developments it's just it's sad you know, in my, my first episode or, that I was on, you know, I said uh, there was a single street light that where the paved road met the gravel road. And that that light actually was a beacon for me and my little brother when we would walk two miles. Because we lived about two miles down this road. And you could see that at the end of the road. And that was our focus. And there were times where we would, we'd, we'd have to get up at 4 in the morning, 4.30 to catch the bus. Because we live in a rural area, and anybody who lives in a rural area knows that, you know, you have these these bus routes, and they're they take they go all over the place. So you got to catch a bus early. So we would get up early, and we'd we would power walk as fast as we could, and sometimes we'd hear something on both sides of us, you know, like it was like it was walking with us. But what what I saw that one morning, early morning, like one in the morning, uh. 
I saw an odd color eye shine on the road. You know, it was like an amberish, you know, reddish eye shine. And I go, Dad, there's something in the in, on the road. He's like, no, no. I go, Dad, turn your brights on. And the road kind of, you know, had these little rises and these dips. And as we were coming back up this rise, boom, there she was. My dad hit the brights. And I say she because she, it was a she. It was undeniably it was a she. And she just turned. She didn't like turn her head, but she turned her body. And she just kind of looked. And just blinked and then turned again. And then within like two steps, she was off into the tree line. And as we drove by, there's still enough light from my dad's fog lamps or fog lights, whatever, that I looked over and I was maybe from here, 15, 20 feet maybe. And I could see her clear as day. I saw her face. She was squatting in the woods, trying to stay as, as small as she possibly could. And uh, she I watched her blink her eyes. And when I said when when she stood up, I didn't think she was gonna stop standing up. Like she just kept going and going and going. I'm like, holy crap, my dad, my dad didn't speed. My dad didn't lose control of the vehicle. He just kept going, pulled right on into our driveway, you know, that that uh that he had made for because we were gonna build a house out there and and before that car even stopped, I was already door was open and I was a dead run towards the camper and unlocked the door. You know, and so, I mean, yeah, that was, I mean, I saw, I, I saw her, I saw her, I've seen her more than one time on that property, but I didn't get the same feeling from her as I had earlier, you know, a few years earlier from whatever was in those woods, you know, now there was one, there, there was one male in that area where we lived, um, that, that he, was a jerk i mean i always got bad vibes from him like if he if he was not held in check i want to say by the mom i'm thinking he was like the older son because out of the blue my little brother said one day hey i've seen two small ones i go what do you mean you've seen two small ones he goes well whenever we were out here on the deck and we're playing music i can see him over in the tree line they sit there and they, they listen to the music with us and then when we turn it off or whatever we go inside they leave so the music drew them out and sit there and, and they wouldn't do anything. You know, they, they wouldn't cause any problems. But that older one, like the young adult or whatever, you know, he was the one that hit our camper one night. You know, we had a real bad storm and all of a sudden our camper went like this and came back down. Straps had popped. Uh, the the cement blocks that it was on. My dad, I mean, my dad had this thing locked down solid and the, the, the anchoring straps were, were broken or pulled up and our camper literally tipped like this and then slammed back down and uh huge dent on the side of the camper and then the male the, the i want to say the dad i've seen him not clear as day but he was very ominous he just let you know and you knew when he was in the area because it just everything changed the the air uh it just got thick and it wasn't like he was aggressive. He just wanted it to be known that, Hey, I'm here. And you can never get us, uh, you never get a clear pit, you know, clear view of him. He'd be like, and then he'd come like this, or he'd see his hand reach around like a tree. And then he'd do one of these and then come back like this. And you wouldn't see his whole face. You see just like part of his face. Like he, just so he can kind of see, and then he'd whip back around. So, you know, he's there. You know, I think they're like people. I, I think that some of them have great intentions, you know, they're okay. And then others, you know, you just, you, you meet the wrong, the wrong one. Like you guys did out, out like you were, and <laughs> that was just a terrible experience. But, you know, I just want to say thanks again for, for coming on the show. I love having you on the show, man. It's always a good time. And, um, again, man, I appreciate your service to our country. Thanks for your sacrifice, man, which you did for us. And, and I appreciate you coming on and sharing those stories with us. I'm, I'm glad you're still here from all those experiences, man. I'm, I'm glad you're all right. You know, I mean, and here's the thing, you know, I, I, I've, I've said before, I mean, I sent you a, a chapter of a book that I'm reading, you know, and in an email I said, you know, I've honestly believed that I'm, I'm sensitive, like not emotional. Well, I am emotional. I mean, ever since I became a dad and now a grandpa, my emotions, man, are all just whacked out little things like, uh, <laughs> just commercials like those Sarah McLaughlin commercials. I hear those. I start bawling. Them. I got turns to change. I can't stand it, you know, but, um, no, I mean, I, I've had experiences, you know, with the, with the, with the paranormal, you know, spirits, angels, um, demons, uh, you know, I, I have 
that's why I'm writing a book. And I, I don't know if anybody wants to hear, you know, hear my stories. You know, I mean, people. Well, I tell you what, I, I think what we ought to do is because people love to listen to you. They love it when you come on. Um, let's have you on and do a whole episode about some of those experiences. I would love to do that and give you an opportunity, guys. I, I actually have read some of this. Uh, that he's writing and it's extremely well written really riveting it kind of it really gave me chills so you want to make sure to check it out when he gets it done because i think people you know people you're so good at telling these things that have happened to you man and um i don't know you're just you're a likable guy man you're so and you're believable i think that's the biggest thing for me i've talked to a lot of people you're very believable i believe everything you're telling me and so if you're up for that man i'd love to have you back on and and share some of those experiences so hey I'll be on as, as many times as you want me on or as many times as your followers want. I mean, I mean, seriously, you know, guys, again, I'm not trying to convince anybody that that something's going on out there. I'm not trying to convince anybody that Bigfoot's real. I'm just letting, you know, just telling people out there, you know, this is what I've, I've experienced in my life. And again, I haven't lived your, your typical life. I, I, I really have. You know, I mean, uh, uh, my wife does not like to hear me talk about my childhood because it was a very uh dark very violent childhood for me you know uh parents being divorced and married four times step parents you know they have the moniker wicked step parent for a reason you know so uh the gambit has happened you know and it's it's just uh my wife looks at me and she shakes her head sometimes and she i go what what you know what did i do now you know but she's like how how you are not in prison or how you are not uh, an addict or how you are not dead just by your past amazes me. And I'm here to tell you guys, if this reaches somebody and this touches your heart, you guys listen to me. I'm walking proof that you are in control of your own destiny. You do not have to walk the path that you think is laid before you. You really don't. There's only one path that's laid before us, and Josh can attest to this, and it's the path that God, that God gives us. Now, we're always going to be on that path. There's little branches that we're going to have to go off on. We're going to have to get these experiences ourselves. But honestly, you guys, you guys are in control of your destiny. Always, always test yourself and give yourself the best chance you possibly can. Work hard in everything you do. Be humble. And most of all, you have to be kind. And I promise you, you will find your way to that path. And when you do, your life will be so much happier and so much enriched. Um, I've taken a beating. I'm 50, almost 52 years old, and I, I wear my scars. Uh, I cover some of them, and I wear some of them on my sleeves. And if I can be an example to people like, hey, you guys can make it. You guys can make it. And if you're having a rough day, always know there's someone out there that you mean the world to you may not think so but you're everything in the world to them and always remember that so keep your chin up man that's some solid advice uh and and you are man you're a you're a walking miracle and that that just goes to prove that god has a when god has a purpose for your life it's not over till he says you know what i mean and he'll carry you through the storm. He's your strength, guys. And and just, you know, if I give any advice, I'll back up what he says. Just uh, you have purpose and you have meaning and you you matter to somebody. So uh, you matter to me. You matter to, to Daniel. Uh, we appreciate you guys listening to this podcast. And the best advice I can give you through this whole thing is, guys, stay prayed up. Stay prayed up. Best thing you can do. I appreciate you guys jumping on the podcast. Daniel, thanks for coming on. If you have a mystery or something you want to share with me, you can send it to me by email at video at jscreativear.com. I appreciate each and every one of you guys, and we'll talk to you in the next episode. Stay prayed up.